In a world where Twitter leads the headlines and the 24-hour news cycle forces people to choose sides, we're here to help you cut through the noise and discover that the truth lies somewhere in the middle. Hosted by entrepreneur, author, public speaker, and regular media contributor, Seth Denson. Subscribe, share, rank, and review. Welcome to Somewhere in the Middle on the Real News Communication Network. We are back somewhere in the middle. I'm Seth Denson. Welcome to the show, everybody. It's Monday. Monday, while the beginning of the week is somewhere in the middle in here. <laughs> We're glad to have you part of this one. Zach, how are you, buddy? I'm doing okay. A little dark on the camera today. I might see if I can do something about all that. Right. But otherwise, great. Yeah, for not those of you... Not dark in your personality, just no, in your life. No, not at all. Yeah, black is my heart. No, for those of you uh, <laughs> watching, yeah, it might be a little... A little cozy in the in the in the control room, but things in the studio are looking good. Seth, how are you? I'm I'm doing really well. I'm, I got to tell you, I'm really excited about today's show. Yeah, and the reason I'm excited about today's show is twofold. The first is that this is show eight. Show eight, episode eight. And Andrew, prior to the show, gave me a nice little statistic that the vast majority of podcasts end at show seven. Yes. We are better than the majority. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> we've made it. It's if we go victorious. nowhere from here, we've at least done more than most. Right. You cleared that hump. And and that is admirable at the Thank end of the you. day. Yeah. I appreciate Congrats. it. Congrats. Big well part done. of that, buddy. Thank Aww, you. Aw, thanks. The second reason I'm excited about today's show is this is the show that I've wanted to do since we talked about doing this show. But out of fairness to other topics and things going on in the world, I thought I would use this as the Catalyst 8 show mm -hmm. to show that we have made it past the hump, <laughs> and that is healthcare. Healthcare. As most of you know, if you're a regular listener to the program, uh, I am in the healthcare industry. I've been in healthcare for nearly 20 years now. All of my adult vocational life has been dedicated to the healthcare industry, and I have always had some very opinionated thoughts on health care. Yeah. And while we will not even be able to scratch the surface of all of the things that I have to say on health care, we will, we will take up a couple of key topics that are hot off the presses in the news over the last couple of weeks as it relates to health care. And so I'm really excited about that. And what we're going to do is we're going to take that and we're going to blend it with what's going on just kind of across the, the social scene as it relates to healthcare. Because, uh, you know, interestingly enough, a report out last week um, or the last couple of weeks from NPR, and I think it was redone by uh, CNBC, was that health insurance companies are now partnering with data mining firms to learn more about their potential customers. Now that, that doesn't sound good. I mean, at the offset, maybe I'm wrong. Well, it depends know. on where you land sure. on it, right? Yeah. Because if you're an insurance company or a shareholder of an insurance company, you're all too happy that insurance companies are checking in on people. Yeah. But if you're a user of health insurance, maybe you want to be sure that that extra burger joint you checked into last week on Facebook Maybe the underwriter that's setting your rates isn't looking at that. Right. Or that cute little emoji that you put out there saying <laughs> that you were super depressed uh, or all amped up on Mountain Dew. Uh, whatever your your thing might be, that sure. uh, the person that's setting the premiums isn't looking at those things. So this was an investigative report done by NPR. And by the way, when I think investigative reports, my <laughs> mind immediately goes to NPR. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> but it was a report uh, done by NPR, which was an accurate report because we did our own research on it following the, the, the report that came out, only to have a secondary report come out, uh, you know, in the last week that not only are insurance companies partnering with data mining firms, they're also partnering with genetic testing firms. So we've all seen the commercials on these 23andMe commercials right find out more about your ancestry find out more about where you're from you're one-fourth lithuanian and uh, <laughs> that means that you just might like uh, vodka i don't know what it means but apparently if you go in and you do a little mouse swab and you send that data in they can find out all these great things about you but did you know that they may be selling that data to data mining companies and those companies are then turning around and selling that data to insurance companies. 
Makes you feel all warm and fuzzy, doesn't it? You know, it just reminds me, just a, just a hair, I know this isn't the show, it reminds me of like working back in terrestrial radio on AM when I'd hear some guy at 8 o'clock at night, like, you're not going to believe what the government's doing now. Like, everybody get out your tinfoil hats. It sounds crazy. But at the same time, data mining's a real thing. It's a very real thing. I think people underestimate it. It, it is a real thing, and we're all too quick to tell the world everything about us. And by the way, I'm guilty of this from time to time. My sure. wife reminds me quite often, um, you don't have to post everything on social media. <laughs> and, like, and she's right. Well, what about the likes? I know, right? I feel so validated Yeah. Uh, when somebody's liked, shared, or done something. By the way, quick plug. If you're listening to this show, please like, share, rate, and review. <laughs> that makes Seth feel really good about the show. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, you know what? I'm Insurance companies can listen all they want. Right. I'm not on their Christmas card list anymore, and we'll get into that in future shows Ooh. as to the health insurance industry and my thoughts on that. But um, – Anyway, so so yeah, I want to take up this topic today because I think it does blend this idea of what's going on in the health insurance sphere, health care sphere, along with the total, uh, the social media sphere, the Twitter world, uh, and genetic testing. All of this is all about our fingerprint in life. And if your sole purpose as an insurance company, listen to me here for a second, your sole purpose as an insurance company is to return margin to your shareholders the more data you might have the better so i'm joined in the booth as always by mr andrew ellsworth clark himself howdy howdy happy monday still looking sharp man always. a different vest and tie today yes, though thank you. so the vest thing must be your new thing i <laughs> like that you're I the was, vest guy i was going for it yeah all right well good deal glad to have you back on buddy thanks for, good to be here so um, so let's take this on a little bit. Let's talk a little bit about what's going on and what, what these reports have told us and why this really matters to you, our faithful listeners. Um, so this report said, again, a couple of weeks ago, that uh, data mining companies, and there's a number of data mining companies out there. I think LexisNexis out of, I think, Atlanta is one of these big companies. Okay. Um, and there, there, there are literally dozens of these companies. They are setting up health fairs all throughout the country. And they're these, we've all been to these events, right, where you're walking through and you want the, the swag stuff, right, the, the stress ball or the possible free cruise and all this. All you got to do is give them a little information about That's yourself. That's right. So you get a, a pen and a two-gig flash drive. And all you got to right. do is give them your email. It's yeah, good and you're start, on your man. way. Free is free. Hey. By the way, nothing is free. Nothing. Something is always gained by me giving you something. Right. Right. And so what these data mining companies are doing is they're setting up shop. They're inviting people into these health fairs. And, and, and by the way, they're doing some good here. I don't want to just completely dismiss what they're doing. You know, if you're coming in, they're going to check your, your heart and your blood pressure. And, and you're going to get a chance to visit with a nurse or a doctor. And maybe, you know, y get some information about some things that are out there in the world, right? But at the same time, you're also giving over information. And that information is this data about yourself, right? What's your blood pressure? What's your LDL level, right? All of this stuff. But in addition to that, we want you to check in on Facebook that you were here. Ooh. We want you to tweet about this at hashtag we know everything about you. <laughs> right? Because when you do that, now we know. And so the question is, what are insurance companies doing with this? And then we'll, we'll pivot on that here in a minute. We'll talk about what they're doing with the genetic testing stuff. But what these health fairs are doing and the gathering of this data is insurance companies are able to then go buy this data. Now, the report wasn't clear, and obviously insurance companies aren't actively sharing what they're going to be doing with this data. But I don't think it's to make sure they're delivering you more cost-effective access to health insurance. Call me a cynic, but I've been in the business for 20 years, and... I'm a cynic, um, <laughs> uh, and I'm also a realist, and I'm looking at what the share price of insurance companies have done over the past decade, and I assure you they are going up. How do they go up? Newsflash. Collect more money in premiums than you pay in claims. How do we do that? We need to know more about the people that we'll be paying claims on. Now, there's certain aspects of the Affordable Care Act that protect the consumer from a health care side, just like there are aspects of what's called the uh, Genetic Information Non-Discriminatory Act of 2008, signed into law by President George W. Bush. We call it GINA for short. What it says is that 
Gina says that health insurance companies can't use your genetic data based on a test that you've had done to set your rates or penalize you personally. But that doesn't mean that life insurance companies can't. Or disability insurance or long-term care companies. All of these companies that might know want to know more about your future than your past will want to know that information. Because historically, we've always operated in the insurance world in the United States under what are called mortality tables or law of large numbers. And effectively, what that means from an underwriting perspective is my ability to predict the future. I want to know what's going to, what the probability is that you will cost me as an insurance company money. And the more data I have, this is what we call the crystal ball factor. The more data I have on you, the more my crystal ball starts to become clearer. And I can predict the future with pinpoint accuracy. And what we tell the world about ourselves, what we are doing on a daily basis, did we spend more time at the beach? Did we check into that burger joint 20 times? Did we binge watch a show on Netflix till 6 in the morning only to turn around and go to work at 8 a.m.? All of this stuff is data, and all of this stuff is freely given out. And if you read the 80-page terms and conditions on Netflix or on DirecTV, or on Facebook, or Twitter, or 23andMe, you might find that your data is no longer yours once you give it to them. I know that's been an issue on, on Facebook. People have been caught with some kind of photo or something they can't get, and somewhere, somewhere in there, once you submit something on Facebook, they own that JPEG. They that's theirs now. Like you can use it, you can access it, but like at the end of the day, legally, that's theirs in perpetuity, forever. In perpetuity, yeah. It's a dangerous so, thing. So where do we land on this, right? Uh, um, again, capitalism, so, economics. What do you got? Well, if I can be the insurance company here for a second, well, well you about, dress like one. Well, ooh, <laughs> how dare you? <laughs> So what about fraud? That's the big argument on the health insurance side is we, we're looking into your, we look into your Facebook to see if you're frauding us or, or defrauding us. Um, and Misrepresenting that, yourself before exactly. we issue you a policy. Yeah, no, I've never had any knee problems. And yet, hey, there's a picture of you at the beach and you're totally wearing a knee brace. What's going on here? And while I would admit that that is perhaps a you know, legitimate concern, I, I don't agree that that's their primary focus on this, but that is the argument on pushback. But does this go into a bigger question of personal responsibility? You, listen, you're, you're putting it out there. You mean to be personally responsible to not incriminate myself to the insurance well, company? that too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you definitely don't <laughs> want to do that. Um, but again, we, we get so tied up on, oh my gosh, our data's out there. Yet, you put it out there. You signed up for the 23andMe deal to, to find out all, everything about your ancestry. And yet, on that note, so 23andMe also got FDA approval last year to do disease testing. So you can now actually get like a genetic, are you genetically predisposed to certain types of diseases? Mm -hmm. You have a marker for cancer, marker for Alzheimer's, things of that nature. Now, even if you didn't sign up for that, so I didn't pay the extra 20 bucks to have my disease markers checked, that's not saying the company can't do it for you and now they do still have that data. They, you gave them the swab with your DNA. They can run that test and still sell that even if you yourself didn't, pay for it to get the results. Yeah, and that, that's the interesting point. So full disclosure, I actually did one of those tests. <gasps> I know, right? Where are you from? <laughs> Not, I didn't do the ancestry test, although I am Scott Irish. I do know that. Um, uh, I did the test on the disease management and understanding what I am more likely to be prone to. And I do that. I'm in the healthcare world, right? I want to know because I, I am a firm believer that we shouldn't just blindly trust our doctors and hospitals and systems. Again, I don't want to go all, you know, far off the grid on this and the healthcare system's out to get me. But in some ways, parts of the healthcare system are out to get my money. Uh, and, and if I am putting something or ingesting something into my body like a prescription, I want to make sure that there is that that prescription is going to do right by me based on my overall genetic structure because based on how I am chemically composed, certain prescriptions might do different by me than others. This is what we call a genome test. And, and by the way, people like heptologists do genome tests when if you were diagnosed with something like hep C to make sure that one of the three hep C treatment drugs that are out there in the world is going to have the best reaction to how you're chemically made up. We're all different. We're all unique. Just like our fingerprint, our DNA makeup is unique too. And, and, and having this information can be a positive thing. 
can be. Because if I know that I am uh, more likely to react differently to one drug over another, well, I want to make sure I'm taking the drug that is going to be best for me. And I want my doctor to have that information, too, because I want them to know, hey, you know what? Based on how you are made up, this is what you need to do. I did it also from a nutritional a nutritional basis. So if you're on camera uh, and you're watching us on, on here today, I am half the man I used to be. <laughs> and by the way, Zach, you're looking good, too, man. Thanks. Yeah, I appreciate it. So we're, we're all in this world of trying to be more fit and healthier and all this so yeah. um it, you can't tell if you're if you're listening on the radio or or you're wa even watching on on camera through youtube or facebook but um i am five nothing and back in the day i was about 225 pounds well pretty good for five nothing yeah that's, yeah. that's pretty yeah so five seven but you know we're, we're rounding <laughs> down here but no i'm five eight when i wear my good shoes yeah. um but anyway 225 pounds is a lot of a lot of mass to fit into <laughs> not a lot of quantity like I, I, if i was six four that's fine but i'm not i'm five seven and a half and two thirds mm. so you know for me i needed to find a way to be more healthy and what i learned through doing this test was that certain diets will work for me mm -hmm. certain ways of exercising my body will Re react to better so i was still trying to do all the things that i'd learned or read online or the new fad and finding that none of it was working and my doctor was very clear seth you got to lose some weight we got to figure out how to do this and i went and saw a nutritionist and actually it was one of the nutritionists that recommended i do this genetic test yeah so i did and it was awesome i got this and it had to probably been 60 page report on what medications work but what exercise regimens work and what um diet would work and what I found was a very clear path to get the best result. And lo and behold, six months after getting this test, I lost 60 pounds in six months. I didn't drastically change my life. I didn't live in a gym or forego food. I just learned more about me and what was going to work best for me. And it was powerful. And so these types of tests, this type of information, I know we're, we're, we're taking on two topics here with the genetic testing versus the social media posting, but this data can be powerful. And in my world as a healthcare strategist where I advise clients all the time how to better navigate the healthcare system, knowing more about yourself can be a great thing. But we all must be cognizant about what we're allowing others to know about us as well. Right? Yeah but there should still be a little bit of protection on that. And that's really where we've got to start having a different conversation and where maybe for the last few minutes of our show here today, because this has been a, a we're, we're doing a kind of a more quick yeah, speech show here bit, today. Yeah. Um, because listen, healthcare could be a topic that we do 20 times and take 45 minutes to an hour every time and not even scratch the surface. You, you could do your own podcast on just healthcare. Well, honestly, I bet you could do a whole series on it. No problem. Sure. And maybe we will. Maybe. Right. Yeah. Uh, but but for today, wait, what where does Uncle Sam fall in on all this? Where does the government take a position of I mean, again, these terms and conditions pages are, are written by brilliant attorneys that cost a fortune and that's why they're so long and written in this archaic way that nobody can really read them. And by the way, nobody does. So, I would say you don't necessarily need to be protected from yourself, but how about things like genetic information can't be used to discriminate me against a mortgage or employment or selling me a car? Um, and right now, there is no laws against that. If, if you're a bank and I'm applying for a mortgage for your house, you could use that genetic testing to say, like, he might be dead in 30 years. I don't think we're going to go for this. 20-year mm -hmm. mortgage or nothing. Yeah. You know, and like, okay, hey, maybe that's a little bit too much. Um, you know, or, hey, we're not going to give you a job working outside because you're likely to get skin cancer based on your genetic testing, and then I'm going to have to pay for it. And I think there should be a boundary somewhere in there for discrim genetic discrimination. Um, yeah, Liz, I agree. And I think this is the challenge that, that again, I, and I've stated this a number of times, I'm a free market capitalist, right? But you do come, when it comes to health care, you oftentimes do find this conflict where when we take capitalism and immerse it in the aspect of our health care, aren't we in sometimes a conflict there? A lot of the time. 
<laughs> and, but this is the argument that the left would make about government-run health care. Right? By the way, if Uncle Sam is paying the tab, you don't think they're watching you? Mm-hmm. I mean, w- we see this in, in, in countries that do have socialized medicine. Uh, you know, in Canada, we, we have a gentleman in our office by the name of Brian who grew up in Canada. His father was a doctor in Canada, and his doctor ultimately moved to the United States because he was tired of being told how to treat his patients. And he was tired of being told that he could treat this patient but not that patient because that patient probably wouldn't live long enough to get the fullest value in how he was treating them. And this is, this is what happens when we do have socialized medicine. The other challenge you have is the United States is the most innovative healthcare economy in the world. The rest of the world looks to the United States for innovation advancement of our medicine and so the moment that we squash that ability for capitalistic return on investment, I think we start to squash the opportunity for innovation and advancement. Yeah, because why would I bother if I'm not going to make money on it? That's right. That's right. So, again, I, we, we're, this show, today's show, kind of an abbreviated show if you've been listening to the rest of them, but we wanted to bring this to your attention because I think this is a conversation starter that we need to start having more of a conversation about. We need to start to recognize a few things about today's healthcare system. There are three components to healthcare in the United States. Three divisions, so to speak. And I used to refer to it as this three-legged stool of the healthcare system, and I don't anymore. I've actually recently started referring to it as the three-headed cannibalistic dragon. <laughs> Of the healthcare system. <laughs> Somehow I knew you were going to go dragon. It's like, I don't know where that came from, but yeah. My cynicism knows no doubt. Sure, yeah, the Cerberus, the dog that guards Hades. That's right. Yeah. So you have the healthcare delivery system itself, and in that is the largest part of the system. You have doctors and hospitals and surgical centers and pharmaceutical companies and pharmacies and medical manufacturers. Effectively, everybody that makes or delivers a component of the healthcare system is the delivery system itself. That is dragon head number one. Okay. Then you have the insurance system. And this is the most misunderstood aspect of healthcare, in my opinion. Because when it comes to health insurance, most Americans who utilize health insurance to access the system think that health insurance is that, insurance. It's not. It's healthcare financing. It is the system by which we finance our health care. So if you're getting your health insurance through your employer, what insurance companies are doing is they're aggregating lots of employers together, and they're lumping them together, and they're collecting these amounts of money and they got to make sure they're collecting more and they're spreading that risk. And thus, the reason for um, the value of insurance. But when we are financing things, we have to start having a real conversation about what we need to finance versus what we don't. Because I, I hear it all the time. Well, I got a $25 copay. What do I care? Well, because whatever the insurance company is paying on your behalf for that $25 copay, they're just going to amateurize it, add margin to it, add interest to it, and sell it back to you over the next 20 years in health insurance premiums. Don't believe me? Look at what your health insurance premiums were 20 years ago versus what they are today. And at the same time, go pull up the ticker symbol of every major publicly traded health insurance company over the last 20 years. You will find they are very valuable. And I have never seen at another point in my life private equity money move into healthcare like I see it now because the returns are so great. So these big banker Wall Street guys that used to invest money in other places are now investing in in healthcare because when it comes to healthcare we the third head of the dragon the consumer are dumb that's it we treat healthcare unlike anything else we consume we wait until that which we have received is received before we ever ask questions about what we've received or at what price we just received it And the other two heads of that cannibalistic dragon, the delivery system and the finance system, feed off of that. 
And until we start to get to a point where we start to peel back the layer of the onion and recognize that we, the consumers, must do a better job of being just that, the consumers, we will not solve this problem of health care in the United States. So help me help me turn this around at the end. Andrew and I were talking before the show, and I was like, I feel like I'm going to need a hug at the end of this whole thing. And I do. <laughs> All right. So, so help, help me see the light here. What's the answer? Take your Flintstone vitamins and everything will be okay? I mean, I know this isn't exactly a podcast where we're making legislation or anything, but I mean, you guys got any any advice to the consumer? Being more informed, being more aware? What do you, what do you got? Yeah, I got a lot of advice, but we don't have the time for all of it today. <laughs> but I'm going to leave you with a couple of key pieces here. First and foremost, part of the solution to a problem is identifying that you have one. And so long we have been sold that we have a health insurance problem in the United States. That was the, what the Affordable Care Act was all about, solving health insurance crisis. Well, health insurance isn't the problem health care is. And I'm not, I'm not de- demonizing people in the healthcare industry. Doctors are great, nurses are great, and even hospital administrators, for the most part, many of them are good. But put them all together and put a capitalistic incentive around it, and their job is to make money. And so the problem that we have isn't health insurance. It's actual cost of health care. And if we want to solve the health insurance problem, one head of the dragon, we must solve the other piece, which is what the finance company, the insurance company is financing, which is health care. And how do we do it? Well, it's not likely we're all going to wake up tomorrow and all these for-profit insurance companies and for-profit hospitals and systems are going to say, we want to do the right thing. We're going (laughs) to stop charging so much. (laughs) And so this is where we have to come together somewhere in the middle and recognize that the argument on the far right that... Everything is about a free market system may not be right. On the flip side, the argument on the far left that we need the government to come in and take complete control will squash innovation, access to care, and maybe our ability as independent citizens to access that care when we feel it necessary. Neither option is the answer. But maybe... The answer lies somewhere in the middle. And so as we think about wrapping up a bow on today's show, a couple of key tips for you. Be cognizant of what you are signing up for, whether that be a genetic test, a Twitter page, Facebook page, Netflix account, any of these things. I'm not saying any one thing negative about any one of these companies. I subscribe to Netflix, I have a Twitter page, I have a Facebook page, and I have done a genetic test. And to me, it was valuable. But I needn't be so naive as to think that it ended there either. Be smart about your information. Be aware of where it's going. Be aware of who's getting it and for what. And when it comes to health care, I do know where I land on starting the conversation towards solving the problem. But before I get into that, thanks, Zach. Thanks for a great show today. <laughs> show number eight. Yeah, it was a good time. Big thanks to the folks here at Real News Communication Network who have kept us on the air beyond seven shows to the eighth show. And I am super excited if we don't get canceled and we get the night. <laughs> Wait and see. Next week. Stay tuned. That's right. Big thanks to Andrew Clark, always in studio, always bringing good thoughts and ideas. Even though he's from California, we still let him in the, in the booth. We appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks for wearing a sharp suit and tie today. Wife beater next week. That's all it is. <laughs> no, never mind. No, there you no. Go. No, we, we may not invite Andrew to next week's show. <laughs> um, uh, a special thanks to my beautiful wife, Jenna, my wonderful daughters, Emerson and Arabella, who make me want to find a solution to what's going on in the healthcare world because healthcare is something that we are all going to need as we continue to live our life. And while I may be considering a number of things, I do know where I land on this, the healthcare debate. The United States boasts arguably the most innovative healthcare system in the world. However, innovation does come at a cost, and while our system leads to the world leads the world in advancement, it also leads the world in price too. According to the World Health Organization, the United States ranks 37th in overall health amongst other countries while ranking number one in overall cost. Sometimes what you get isn't what you pay for. That's nearly double the cost of other first world countries. 
Infant mortality is nearly double that uh, in other comparative nations here in the United States. And while the U.S. ranks 19th overall in obesity with more than 33% of our population listed as obese, we pay more for our health care, too. In addition, with all of the brilliance behind our system, we lose more of our citizens to heart disease, diabetes, and cancer than we do all other causes of death combined. Despite what we might think, American citizens don't actually consume more health care than the rest of the developed world. We just pay more for it. And why? Health care in the United States has become like a drug. In a world of addictions inclusive of caffeine, tobacco, opioids, and social media, we are a society influenced by our modern dependencies. It wasn't always this way, and dependencies aren't always addictions. I depend on water and air in the same way that to live life to the fullest, I depend on health care. However, over the past century in the United States, we have perverted the way in which health care is delivered, accessed, financed, and consumed. As such, the healthcare industry acting the role of a drug dealer has made pawns of us all. The good news is, however, we can break the addiction and reestablish a healthcare system meant to positively impact the lives of our citizens. It's just going to take some compromise and a little common sense. If you're on the right, you likely subscribe to the belief that a free market system, uninfluenced by government involvement and regulation, is the answer. And if you are on the left, you likely believe that a single-payer, government-run system just might do, this, do the trick. Regardless of where you fall on either side of these beliefs, the solution just might lie somewhere in the middle. Neither a government takeover is the answer, nor is the government completely removing itself the answer either. But where? With a healthcare system that makes up roughly a sixth of the U.S. economy and has the largest single lobby in Washington, D.C., as well as the fastest-growing sector in our economy, how would one re-engineer health care without crashing the entire economic engine? Yes, health care itself is terribly complex, but the health care challenge is actually quite easy. There's only one major factor driving the problem. Cost. Or dare I say, profit. Now let me be clear, I am a free market capitalist. I believe that our economic system in the United States is the greatest on the face of the earth and that it is our capitalistic mindset that drives our innovation. But when it comes to a person's health, blended with the ability of another's profit margin, we find ourselves in a conflict of capitalism and care. And this is where common sense solutions must come into play. We must balance the cold, clinical response of business and the heartfelt emotion tied to our health in order to cure the ill, no matter the cost, to find a practical yet compassionate solution. We need pricing transparency in the healthcare system. An intravenous bag, also known as an IV, costs less than $1 to produce, yet is billed on average more than $500 per unit by hospitals within the United States. Yes, simple math tells us that is a markup of more than 54,000%. Welcome to healthcare. And yet, I'm provided and billed for those IV bags without ever being consulted on cost prior to my using them or even their overall necessity. You should not be able to force me to buy a mystery product without first knowing the value and the price of that which I may be consuming. I would never buy a car by driving it off the lot without first understanding what it's going to cost, only to have you bill me later. And yet, that is how the healthcare system works. We have laws that regulate almost every economic transaction in the country, yet we are seriously lacking proper oversight in the healthcare space. We need a little Uncle Sam. It's not likely these non these profit organizations within healthcare are going to wake up one day and choose to reduce their margins. We need the government to regulate, but not run healthcare and the healthcare highway. We need to set speed limits on these transactions, not price set, but to protect the consumer. 
We deserve a fair and transparent marketplace. Capitalism works when I buy one product over another based on quality, cost, and a dozen other factors that each consumer gets to determine. But patients have no such options when it comes to health care. That isn't fair. It isn't right. And it must change. Finding myself somewhere in the middle, I'm Seth Denson.